before the 18th century, this is, if you were crazy, this is what you were. You were either a maniac, raving, furious, or distracted. You were either melancholic, you were an idiot, you were a lunatic, or you were obsessed or possessed. And the obsession-possession thing is the thing that interests me the most. And those were caused by demonic possession. That is, the devil uh, inhabited you. And, and the difference between being possessed and being obsessed is that if you're, posse if you're possessed, if you're upset, well, okay, if you're obsessed, it means that the devil has taken possession of you. And the term is from Warcraft, by the way. It has to do with besieging a citadel. So the devil has besieged your citadel and has surrounded you and has not broken through the central, you know, the moat and the door. So you're still inside. And you know, so you're able to say, if you're obsessed, you're able to say, I know that the devil is obsessed, it has me. The fact that you can say it means that you know it. But if you're possessed, you no longer know it. The devil's broken in, taken you over completely. Linda, Love, you know, Linda Blair, you know, uh, it's, the, it's the, the whole idea of being possessed. So the thing about these categories of madness in, before the 18th century is that they're all about being totally crazy. You know, you can't be a little crazy before then. You, it's, a it's like being pregnant. You know, you can't be a little pregnant. So, but then in the, eight, and, and, and here's the two sort of big categories. This is a statue from the entrance to um, Bedlam Hospital with, on, you know, with, with the character on the left is the depressed melancholic and on the right, the raving character in chains. So that was the two poles be, uh, of madness before this period. Um, and here's a picture of, uh, you know, from an insane asylum in the 18th century, a madhouse of a raving man being uh, restrained. Then there's a new category that comes in, and they, they're diseases that we no longer generally approve of, uh, hysteria, hypochondria, vapors, or spleen. But the important thing about them is that they're characterized by partial insanity. You don't have to be completely crazy anymore. You just have to be a little crazy. And it's really the birth of neurosis, right? It, it's the idea that everybody can be a little crazy, and, it's, and you're rational, you're not irrational. But this is the beginning of the idea of obsession, that you're aware of it, you're partially crazy. It's the kind of Woody Allen you know, uh, idea. And I, I, in a group like this, I would, I would just generally say, like, how many people here who are not neurotic? Would, would you please raise your hands? <laughs> it's, no one ever raises their hand. So I mean, the thing is that um, it becomes a state of modernity to be a little crazy, um, partially crazy. It's what I call the democratization of madness. And, you know, er, and then, if, in that case, everybody needs a therapist, everybody needs a doctor to treat this. And people were well aware of it in the t at the time. In 1768, Robert Witt wrote, in my opinion, the generality of morbid affections so depend on the nervous system that almost every disease might be called nervous. They discovered nerves and they went nerve crazy. And, um, so, and then there started to be popular books in the 18th century, books like this one that sold very well on, on, on nervous disorders. Um, Thomas Trotter, wrote, at the beginning of the 19th century, we do not hesitate to affirm that nervous disorders may be justly reckoned two-thirds of all diseases of which civilization is afflicted. So we've gone from a thing where nerves suddenly enter our lives in this way that they never did before. And the other thing is that not only that, but it's the best people who, in the other way, in the earlier model, it was the outcasts and so on who were mad. But now it's everybody. So George Cheney, who wrote this famous book called The English Malady, says that it's not the, cr it, the people who get it are of the liveliest and quickest natural parts, whose faculties are the brightest and most spiritual, whose genius is most keen and penetrating, and particularly where there is the most delicate sensation and taste both of pleasure and pain, not fools, weak or stupid persons, heavy or dull souls. So then the idea is that it's the geniuses and the sensitive people and so on who have uh, nervous problems, and, and what is the nervous problem in particular in this era? It's that you do one thing too much, you know. Um, if you dwell too long upon one and the same thought, which is exactly the idea of what obsession is. We see obsession coming into being, and it gets called num a number of things in the 19th century, one of which is monomania, which is, which is the, the big diagnosis. The other thing is that almost every famous person in the 19th century, and I have a little selection of them, uh, writes their autobiography and puts in their autobiography their nervous breakdown. So you have to have a nervous breakdown in order to be a genius. So you have Ruskin, you have Florence Nightingale, you have Emile Zola, uh, and many other people in the 19th century. And th that's a key point. So suddenly it becomes a sort of important part of being modern, of being, of being um, you know, sensitive. 
Uh, this is a picture of La Salpetre, which is the biggest uh, insane asylum in Paris. And, the, and in the 1920s, monomania, which means you think about one thing too much, was the most common disorder. Um, now, then, then what you have is an interesting phenomenon, that psychiatry begins to start. And so psychiatry cuts its teeth, if you want, or becomes the thing it does by studying the monomaniac and the obsessive. And studying, I would say, it obsessively. <laughs> so you, you really have a profession coming into being by the obsessive study of obsession. And so here's an example that they, they believed at the time that you could see monomania in people's faces. So here they took photographs of monomaniacs, they painted them to see if you could come up with a physical correlate to what's going on inside the head. And you can laugh about this, but later on it becomes, we do it now, only we call them brain scans. And we're looking for a physical trace of something.